There is an invite um, link to the left. To the left. Um, screen share. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Tinvin, is um, Tim going to join? Um, no, he's not. He's not going to join. Oh, we have two more guests. Yes, Anoma is on. Hi, Anoma. Welcome. Hi. You got TV? Hi. I'm yes. TV right here. Hi. <laughs> and Sarah, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I think we will start. Um, and well, people might join afterwards. So uh, I, I'd like to thank you, all of you to, to have made to this conversation. Um, we are broadcasting in our YouTube channel, so uh, I don't know how many people are watching, but in any case, this is going to be recorded and will be available to other later. So the idea is that we will have a very formal conversation. I just wanted to, I, I will introduce um, our participants and then uh, we can do a quick round. So uh, we have um, the, the Actually, we don't have, have the three winners of the competition, but we have um, Daniele, Daniele Miller from Celad. Celad is uh, an organization that uh, is using mobile phone um, to bring literacy to people anywhere in any language. Uh, I will invite Daniela to talk about Daniele to talk a little bit more about it later. And we had Zina Herman from Hesperian Health Guide, uh, a non-profit health information and health education source. And they have adapted their health content to create their first mobile app, Safe Pregnancy oh, yeah. and Birth. Um, and then we have, uh, as the rest of the table, Unoma Okorafor, the founder of the WAL Foundation a non-profit organization dedicated to empowering African girls and women by promoting STEM education and enabling female participation in Africa innovation. Tara Lila from Agora Partnership, a global community of entrepreneurs, investors, mentors and individuals dedicated to using the power of business to effect positive change in their communities. And, well, then we have our change makers team. I'm Daniela Matteo, you know, and then we also have Marzina Zukowska, Tienvin, and Isabella Carvalho. So it's great to have you all here. Um, so uh, since this is this is basically uh, the idea is to talk with with um, Daniele and Zina, I would like to invite you to speak, explain a little bit about what you do. And um, what is the innovation that you have been working on? Daniele, would you like to start? Hello? Daniele, we can't hear you. I think you might be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, this is such a wonderful opportunity to meet all of you kind of in person. <laughs> um, this has been a really incredible experience and our team is really excited and it's 
you know, it's been amazing. So um, what we do is we teach, as Danny mentioned, we teach basic reading and writing to adults um, completely through mobile phones. Uh, there are 796 million adults today who lack basic literacy, two-thirds are women. Um, and at the same time, there's six billion people now, 75% of the world has access to a cell phone. So we're utilizing what they have available to them or what most people have available to them to distribute quality basic education. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. It, yeah, no, that's great. Okay. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dina, would you like to come next? Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you also for this really exciting opportunity, and we just feel really honored to have been chosen as a finalist and, and then to um, be chosen as one of the three winners. This is a really exciting opportunity for us, and um, we're really excited about the, um, the publicity that we've been getting since being announced as a winner and also just the opportunity to um, you know, learn from the other winners and other folks at Ashoka and Intel about um, technology for women. So thank you. Um, so I work for Hesperian Health Guides and we have traditionally been a book publisher. We've been around for about 40 years and we publish healthcare manuals for um, communities and low resource settings um, and these manuals help them take charge of their lives and their health and empower them with life-saving health information. Um, our most popular book is called Where There Is No Doctor, but we have about a dozen other titles with different health content ranging from women's health to uh, midwifery to dentistry to environmental health to uh, children with disabilities. Um, and another book on teaching health workers how to learn. Um, so we have quite a breadth of health content, and we're really excited with this burgeoning of new digital technologies to figure out how we can further disseminate our health content on these other channels. Um, so we've been doing lots of exciting work around our new digital platform, and one of those pieces has been our very first mobile app. Um, which we focused on safe pregnancy and birth. And we chose that topic because um, over a thousand women still die every year from um, preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. And we felt like this was a really great topic to spearhead our first mobile app for. So um, the mobile app has, um, it's available for free um, through iTunes and through the Android store. And it's been downloaded over 25,000 times in 155 countries since we released it earlier this year. Um, so we're really excited about the great uptake it's had. And it has lots of life-saving content from how to help a healthy and safe pregnancy um, all the way through what to do if there is a danger sign during pregnancy, birth, or after birth. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Great, thank you, um, Tina. So I, I think I would like to invite uh, Unoma to uh, speak a little bit about her project as well as we have a special guest. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> our organization is called WOW Foundation and that's W-A-A-W. And it's an acronym that stands for Working to Advance African Women. And our mission is to educate African girls and focus especially in science and technology. And <clears throat> similar to what um, Danny said, um, almost uh, two thirds of women in Africa don't get an education. Yeah, because uh, women are considered to be sort of the background. They bring in money. They ha have no, uh, they're just economic value. And especially when you go into science and technology, it's even worse. Uh, it's just considered a male-dominated field. And so our mission is to educate the African community about the benefits of educating an African girl, but especially to expose the girls 
to careers in science and technology and to let them know that they can be successful scientists and mathematicians uh, and also still be a, a successful woman in the community. So um, we, do, we have two main things that we focus on. Our organization is um, about uh, five years old now and we've been running a scholarship for African girls who are studying science and technology in African universities. And then uh, we're also um, we're also uh, focusing on doing a science camp. In these camps, we'll get girls who are between 13 years old and 15 years old together in a place. Uh, it's a residential camp, and we expose them to all kinds of science-based topics, ranging from robotics to just basic uh, science skills. Many of these girls, sometimes they come in, they have never used a mouse. And so just learning even how to blog, how to make a video, um, and then expose them to um, career, the various careers that they can choose in the science, science and technology. And so that's, that's the focus of our work. Thank you, Noma. And uh, Lila, is, I can't see your video, but um, are you listening and being, can you, would you like to say something about Agora? Yes, definitely. I'm really sorry for being the only one without a video, but my computer does not have a video camera. I'm a bit embarrassed. <laughs> but but yes, I'd love to talk about our innovation project. Um, basically, Agora is a non-profit uh, where we promote entrepreneurship, but not just entrepreneurship, but as well as Ashoka, we promote um, social enterprises. Uh, we have a program called The Accelerator, where we pick um, companies, um, social companies from all Latin America. Uh, until this year, we worked with only, in only Central America, and we're expanding into the whole region. Um, we're gonna work. We're about to accept about forty um, social entrepreneurs from Latin America, and our program is about to start in, on on January, and maybe. Um, Further in the in the hangout talk, we can I can talk about the Women Accelerator uh, Fund that we are just about to launch tomorrow, um, and how we can cooperate. Um, it's so funny I, <laughs> that you don't see the video, but there's my picture. Um, I'm, I'm, Agora has two offices, one in Nicaragua and the other one in DC. Right now I'm talking to you from DC, but I'm Nicaraguan and I'm based in the Nicaragua offices. Um, so I'm like really in touch with all the impact that we're making in the region and, and really in touch with the social entrepreneurs. Um, my role in the in the organization is to do communications and, and marketing, basically just spread the word and and do a research over entrepreneurs and, and look for the social entrepreneurs uh, who sometimes they don't even know that they're social enterprises. Um, that's basically it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. So, thank you all of you uh, for the introductions. As I said, the idea is that we have, uh, this is a very informal conversation, so I will, um, I have a question to, to start us off, but please jump in and, and uh, contribute and ask questions uh, while we, we are talking, okay? So this is, my question is, uh, well, I think this is this is the basic question that all innovators do when you know they participate in a competition in a change makers competition, uh, Daniela and Zina. Zina. Uh, so how did you get so many votes? How, how, what was the strategy to you know mobilize your community and and uh, so if you can share any ideas with us. <clears throat> Should I start? Sure, go ahead, Danielle. Okay. Um, when you, it's funny because when I first, when we first learned that we were finalists and we, you gave us those tips of how to vote, we, I, I was thinking, gosh, how are we going to do this? Um, but I would say probably the best, you know, the way we got a lot of our votes is really just utilizing our network, you know, both within the United States and abroad. We've been a um, 
you know, we've been an organization for about for two years, and since then we've met, we've made connections with a lot of different mobile platforms, with universities, and educational organizations, and policymakers, and even uh, CEOs of companies and corporations. And we really um, relied on their help, and you know, and and connect, you know, connecting with their network and spreading the word that way, you know. And it just through that, and you, know, it just kind of got viral, I would say. Um, and I mean, of course, I can't forget our family and friends and utilizing their networks. And and um, actually, through them, we were even we had the opportunity to go on a local radio station and talk about talk about it. So, um, I mean, the thing is, people are really busy. And if you highlight the fact that it literally takes ten seconds to potentially make a big difference, people want to do it. You know, it's a win-win. It takes no time, and they ha they can make an impact. So, um, and then of course, I mean, we couldn't have done it without social media, Facebook, and Twitter. And for a while, I was literally walking around with my iPad and telling everyone I saw about the competition and about what we're doing and asking them to vote. So. I think all of those things combined really helped us. Great. Zina, would you like to speak about it? Sure. Um, so I think I'm just going to be echoing a lot of things <laughs> that were already mentioned. Um, but we, we work with a lot of partners already um, to develop our health materials, and we rely on them for um, reviewing our materials and making sure that they're um, you know, speaking to the needs of the community. So we have, we work with hundreds of um, partner organizations around the world. So we obviously reached out to our constituency of people who help us to develop the materials and um, who then use them in their work once the, once the materials are finished and published. Um, so specifically, we did lots of e-blasts. Um, so sending out our newsletters to all the folks who use their materials, whether they were a Peace Corps volunteer or whether they were a missionary or whether they were just using it for their own personal use while they were traveling or something like that. Um, and then another specific strategy we used was we had a, a we called it a blitz hour. So um, we set aside one hour um, for all of our staff, which isn't very big, but it's about 20, 22 people. Um, and during that blitz hour, we had them um, send emails or post on Facebook or tweet um, to all their friends and family, letting them know about this really exciting opportunity and encouraging them to vote. And I think dedicating, um, setting aside that specific time was really helpful to get people to really, um, you know, turn it into action. Um, Another helpful thing was that coincidentally during the voting period was the American Public Health Association Conference, um, the APHA, which is a big annual meeting, and it was based here in San Francisco, which was convenient for us. Um, and so we, everyone that we met who came to our table at the conference, we told about this opportunity and asked them to vote for us. Um, and we actually had a couple opportunities to present about our mobile app at the conference. So we had some panels where we were sharing about the app and how we developed it and what we've learned from it. And we always mentioned that we were a finalist. So hopefully some folks in the audience remember to go home and vote for that as well. Um, and yeah, I just want to echo that this was a really great way to get people to feel like they were involved and, and participating in our work that was a very low effort. So. You know, we weren't asking them for a donation. We weren't asking them for a ton of their time. Um, it was a very low threshold way to get people to feel like they could contribute to our work and, and help us um, be more successful. Great. Thank you. So uh, it seems that I, I think it's, it's very interesting the way that we, that you, you know, connect with friends and uh, with using technology to bring votes and to engage people in this movement. So my next question, and this is really to, <laughs> to uh, pass it along, is so what, what do you think are the, the barriers that we are about to solve in terms of uh, engage people in this movement to empower girls and women, and, and what's the role of technology on this? And, and Unoma and, and Sara, if you want to, you know, participate that too, please, come ahead. 
Okay, I can go. I can go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about some of the barriers that we see uh, with, with the girls that we work with in terms of engaging them with technology. Um, and in Africa, a lot of the barrier is just the mindset, the 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 fact that people don't really believe that women should be educated, and that usually they consider an educated woman as being um, sort of overexposed. And so that's part of the barrier, just the fact that people don't think that women should be educated beyond maybe basic home education, maybe cooking, maybe religious education. So that's one of the barriers that we face. Um, but I have to say that the mobile phone uh, technology has really come into um, come in full circle in, uh, in our society. One second, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and um, okay. yeah, I apologize. I should, I should have turned that off. Um, but uh, we now see that a lot of um, a lot of people are actually beginning to look to their cell phones to get just basic information. Uh, we see a lot of our college students, a lot of our scholars who are now doing research on their phones because uh, there's a huge lack of textbooks in Africa and many of the textbooks are outdated. So people are now even doing basic research on their phone. People are starting to learn how to blog, how to speak out, how to have their voices heard and it's just beginning to make an impact. So I, I think that the, self, the cell phone is a, is a huge thing that has come in and has made a huge change in how our technology is affecting the lives of women. Um, so I don't know if that addresses uh, what you were thinking of, or I have a few questions too. Um, maybe later in the discussion, I have a few questions. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, but, but I'll pass it along though. <laughs> if somebody has something else. Uh, yes, um, maybe I, I may jump in. Um, right now we're launching uh, this campaign and actually technology has played a really important role when it comes to communication. Um, right now uh, we're, I mean the, national, the global trend is like uh, equality, that women should be as next to men, etc. But right now our argument is actually putting women and promoting women in a different level than men. We're promoting women as social responsible and we we have statistics that prove that women invest money in in a better way than men do so when it comes to social responsibility and, and, and socially thinking and for example technology and communication when it comes to blog has been a huge important role have you ever heard of AS 2.0 it's a blog for women um, they promote women entrepreneurship but for example they have thousands of followers and, and subscribers and if it wasn't for them for them and for the, the these blogs and um, I mean I don't know like it, the culture would wouldn't be the same like just as an example of, of, of the role of blogging and partnering with these people for 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 these campaigns has been a huge I mean it's super useful for for us and to spread the word yes yes thank you okay so I, I will uh, pass the word then um, um, would you like then to start with the question yes so I, I guess I had a question for Dina in terms of their their project which was the the health guide and um, you had mentioned that you, 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 your project, so the project that won the competition, is that the mobile app that you developed for pregnancy and, and uh, childbirth? So in terms of going forward, what is your organization's plan for using this, maybe using the app you already have or even for developing new apps to help women and um, how is technology playing a role in that or how are you pushing your app forward and how are you monitoring how it's helping women um so i'm just curious about um 
what the impact is, how you're able to measure the impact, and how you what your plans are to follow up on that. That's a that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so our plans for moving forward right now, the app is only available in English, which is um, we realize a huge barrier for most of the world. So we're actively working on getting the app translated into other languages. Um, we are planning on launching the Spanish version of the app uh, early next year, um, which we're really excited about. And also we have an, um, it's, it's, uh, we call it our open copyright policy, which allows, <clears throat> excuse me, which allows any group around the world to take our material and translate it and adapt it to make it look locally and culturally appropriate. We've had that policy in place for all of our printed materials since the organization was founded and it's still in place for our digital materials as long as the group then does not turn around and make a profit off of our materials. Um, so we're hoping that the app becomes translated into as many languages po as possible. Our books are currently translated into um, I think it's 88 languages and we're hoping that the app um, gets translated into just as many if not more. So obviously making it um, appropriate on the language level is one, one target that we're trying to work towards. Um, and the other, the other um, action that we're taking is trying to get the app available on lower end phones. Um, right now it's just available on iPhone and Android, <coughs> excuse me, which um, we realize are becoming more and more prevalent as the costs of mobile phones are dropping and um, the 3G network is increasing around the world. We're seeing this trend of um, smartphones becoming more and more ubiquitous, but we also realize that not everyone has them, and especially people who need the kind of information that our materials provide um, don't have access to those kinds of phones. So we're looking to partner with some organizations who are doing some M Health projects on lower end phones, like mid mid range phones. Um, and seeing how we can reformat and redesign our app to work on those lower end phones as well um, for those who don't have access to smartphones. So those are a couple of our plans for um, moving forward and just speaking specifically to the app on safe pregnancy and birth. And of course we're also exploring other topics to develop apps on, so other health topics such as um, danger signs for newborn babies, or an app on first aid, or even an app on how to build toilets, um, since safe and sanitary toilets are lacking in um, much of the world. So there's lots of topics that we've been considering that we think can lend themselves very well to um, a mobile phone presentation. Um, so we're exploring new content as well as having the content that we already have um, reach more and more people through new languages and also through different um, lower end technologies. Um, did, that, did that answer your question? I'm sorry, I think there were a couple parts to it that I may not have remembered. Thank you, thank you Zina. Any more questions? What, what I, I wanted to make a comment um, as you know kind of what she highlighted. It's really interesting um, what, or what we'll see with this divide uh, between smartphones and feature phones and low end and how that will affect um, you know quality and access of this information that's becoming more and more accessible um, by I mean while there there is a huge increase in smartphones by 2015 it's estimated that half of phones will be smartphones but that still means that half will be um, you know, low-end feature phones, and it's just, I wonder, you know, it's something to think about, um, you know, how will that affect people who don't have access to these smartphones? You know, will more and more people start develop developing only smart technology, or will they also realize, um, you know, what she does, that they, you know, they need to also focus on low-end technology as well? So it's just something to think about. Yeah, I think this is this is a very key point um, when when you're thinking about uh, empowering. Because uh, actually, uh, just to share my personal background was uh, with digital inclusion programs. So we are always discussing that at the same time that technology can be inclusive, you have to be careful for not creating a whole new group of people that are excluded because they don't have access to it. 
Danielle, how does um, sell ad like how does sell ad work? Like, do you use an app or is it through? No, it's it's all in through. So right now, um, we're in the United States, and it's all completely through audio and SMS. So a student calls in to our platform, and they get you know they immediately hear a a welcome message, which leads them to a mini audio lesson. And while they're hearing the lesson, or before the lesson, they get sent a text message. So they're kind of listening to what they're looking at on their, on their text message screen. And then once they have learned the lesson, it's, the lessons are modules, so they're about one or two minutes. And once they learn the lesson and learn whatever they're looking at, like say a letter, they then respond back to the system, system by sending a text message. Um, with what they just learned, so if and then if they underst if they get it correct, they move forward, and if not, they continuously relearn that module until um, until they are able to move forward. So it's yeah, it's all through. It's it works on any type of phone. Interesting. <laughs> I'm also curious in terms of. Um, Danielle and Zena, both of the technologies, to do, I'm curious to, to understand kind of the teams that put it together, because I've been speaking with a couple of groups that have talked about how there needs to be more women technologists, mm -hmm. like women who are creating the apps, women who are creating, you know, the programs, um, because I guess, you know, more, maybe more attuned to some of the issues. Um, maybe if you guys can provide some insight on that, like the teams that made these projects possible. Um, well, on, on, not unfortunately, but our, our development team is actually a group, I mean, that we hired a, a team to build the platform. We're a really small organization, so we didn't want to hire someone in-house, but they're, they happen to be all men. So that's a really good point, you know, I think that, I mean, I have encountered um, women programmers, but yeah, they're definitely few and far between but you know maybe as hopefully as women become more empowered and you know become engaged in that field we'll see more and more women but as of right now our got our our team are all men <laughs> yeah I mean we have the issue with that except we're trying to get Danny recruited into the tech team um, <laughs> at a show, but we also kind of have that issue as well interesting yeah that's really interesting and how about, um, do you, is your, what about, I'm sorry, I totally don't remember um, your name, <laughs> the other, the other winner's Zina. name. Zina. 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 Sorry. Zina. Zina. Um, yeah, so our, our core development team was about five people, and um, three of them were women, and oh, two of wow. them were men. Um, and the two who were men were actually the ones doing the hard coding, but the women were the ones who were um, designing the app in terms of selecting the content and figuring out how to actually navigate the user through the app and the kind of user interface, the look and feel, the design of the app. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that um, while we did have the two men who were actually doing the programming and the coding um, they were kind of taking their direction from the three women on the team. Um, and also, I think that's, um, we're just lucky that uh, at the organization I mentioned, we have about 22 staff, and we only have three men on staff. So um, at Hesperian, we're, we're definitely just a female-dominated dominated staff um, in terms of, I mean, I think that's pretty typical for a lot of public health organizations. Um, and you know, the combination of writing and editing and public health, it just seemed to attract more women than men for our organization, so. Um, but we don't, we actually don't have these two men programmers on staff. They were, we were fortunate enough to find them through a volunteer network, which was really wow. exciting. Um, and then the other people were on staff, and um, so it was, it was, the three women were on staff, and then the two men were our volunteer coders. It's interesting that you say that you um, it, that you said that um, you know you have women developing the platform and then the guys actually coding it because that 
if you break it down like that, that's kind of what we did too. Um, so I guess in a way we did have women developing the program, just not doing the the hard coding. <laughs> Onoma, how about at your summer camps? Like, what kind of teachers do you try to bring in? Because I've heard this a few times, and I'm kind of curious to know whether you know it's important that women technologists and scientists teach other you know future generation, or it's really just about skills, and we just need more girls and women coding, and then you know oh. Oh, fix kind of the void. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear. So, for our case, one of the um, one of the goals of our camp is role modeling because we've found that girls, it, it's really girls or people actually tend to emulate role models. Like, if you see somebody who's done it before, a mentor, you're more likely to think that you can do it. So for us, it's important that we engage women or female uh, facilitators, female teachers. So um, I would say on our camp, uh, it's almost close to 100% uh, women. We, we bring in women as the career coaches. Women are the science teachers. that We, we look for women math teachers, women facilitators. And all the people who are the uh, camp counselors are also girls who are also, some of them are uh, scholars from our scholarship program, some of them are just university students. And they are there all telling the girls that I've done it before and this is how I did it and they can share their own stories. So for us it's really, that's a very important aspect of it. And we've, we've, we usually find uh, that, that uh, bringing in women is more effective. It's usually just one week of all girls and all women together, so that's that's a good thing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes. yes. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, and and what kind of um, program do they develop? So in our camp, well, I should say that we're going to do our first big camp next year. But well, we've run a pilot, a, a very small pilot camp. And there's a, there's a few things that we focus on. First of all, they have to have basic skills in uh, computing. They just learn about blogging, they learn about Facebook, they learn about just very basic things in technology. And then we, we also uh, partner or do a little bit, I don't know if you've heard about the Scratch program from MIT, where they, the, the girls are taught how to develop a ga gaming program just based on computer graphics. So they learn a little bit about that. And then we haven't actually done this before, but we hope we'll do the robotics part of it um, next year. And which is breaking girls into small groups and letting them play with the robot and actually writing small programs. Um, we've also done things uh, in partnership with Google's uh, CS Unplugged group. Uh, they have something called Teaching Computer Science Without a Computer. And uh, this one is very important for us because when you go back to some of the schools that we work with, they are public schools in in uh, Nigeria is where we are doing our pilot camp. Um, many of them don't even have computers. Sometimes the com there's computers, there's no electricity. Mm -hmm. And so just teaching the idea of programming a language or programming in a computer language without having a computer sitting in front of you is also very exciting because it gets the girls to think about how to write a for loop, how to write an if-then loop and how a computer actually thinks and so that when they actually finally get down to sitting on a computer uh, it's just about learning the language but at least they know the semantics of what a computer program should do. So those are some of the types of things that we, that we, we talk about. Go ahead. Great, thank you. And, and actually that um, kind of um, made me think about um, Danielle and Zena, do you do you know what is the profile of people that are using the programs that you've been? Um, yeah, so um, we we're, the majority we're we just are run, we're running a big research study around LA, and so we we actually have a very good 
you know, we have a lot of detailed information about our students, at least those those in our study. And the majority of our uh, the majority of our students are ages. Uh, we have a couple in their twenties, but it's mostly thirties to late fifties. We have some in our seventies even. Um, you know, they have they most of them have very little. They you know they have very little education from their home countries, maybe one or two years of schooling, um, mainly immigrants. Um, so what, what is the program coverage now? What is the program coverage? Yeah, in which uh, geographic area are you? So right now, I mean, we're basic. well, we've been focusing in LA because that's where our study has been going and our study has been ongoing for um, the past year. In LA alone, there's 200,000 uh, Hispanic adults who lack basic literacy skills. In the United States, there's 1.5 million. So, um, but our program is is all it, it's national. We've done we, we've done a we haven't we're transitioning more from the research into a you know real world analysis. So we're starting to work with different. Um, centers and and different even phone companies that could help us get the message out about our program around the country um, so I mean there so the impact here in the United States is 1.5 million um, and once we once we get more and more people using in the United States we then plan to go you know, into Latin America and at the same time start programming other languages and looking at which countries would be, you know, which countries um, it would work best in, which countries, um, where is smartphones going to be, you know, where are they going to be more popular versus where, where are, where are basic future phones going to be more, you know, be more, um, where there's going to be more basic phones. Yeah, I, I can tell you that in Brazil it would should certainly work. It's, there's a lot yeah. of people here that have a cell phone and still a lot of them are literate. Yeah, so. well, but they speak Portuguese. We right now our right now our program is only in Spanish, but I mean maybe Portuguese will be our next, you know, would be the next language. We might even do English um, just because I don't know if you knew this, but 14% of Americans are considered functionally non-literate. 14% of adults in the United States. So, you know, maybe we would do English. It's just part of our next step is hiring a research and consulting group that could help us make those strategic decisions. Um, you know, where to go next, which languages, where would it be the most effective. Um, but right now we're in the United States. So I had a quick question for you, Daniel. How yeah. do you how do you find the participants who get into your program? Do they do they have are they people who just want to learn who find out about your your program and the calling, or are you actively recruiting them? Um. And, so, and, sorry. Yeah, and and how, how and what how, how does it work with, in terms of their minutes? So when they call in, are they are they using their cell phone minutes and? No, so that's why um, it's been so, well, as far as the minutes go, that's why we've been really focusing on the United States. Our, our original mission was to go international, um, but when we started doing more research of what we should do and how we should start, um, first of all, we noticed, A, that there was a need in the United States with these immigrant populations, and B, in the United States, um, there's these plans that are very... Um, common that there that are unlimited talk and text they're all over the country so and that most of the immigrant population actually owns these phones because they're cheaper to, to they're they're no they're non-contract and cheaper so in the United States it's completely free um, if they have those types of plans so that makes it really easy to operate here um, as we start going internationally I um, that's one of the problems with scalability is, you know, figuring out how to cover those costs and how um, one. I mean, I know that a, a lot of different mobile learning initiatives 
um, partner with different phone companies um, and go that route. So that's something we've been looking at. We're also looking at ways to somehow um, compensate for the minutes, like maybe having advertisements or um, coupons in, in inserted into the program. Um, we have a lot of different ideas. Um, to compensate for cost, but we would never, you know, we would. The idea is to uh, distribute free quality information, so it would never be, you know, a charge to the to the student ever. You know, that's not the mission. I have another small question um, for you. What are like your main advertising partners besides um, the cell phone lines or cell phone companies? Uh -huh. Or how do you communicate beyond just uh, the cellular phones? Um, well, actually, you know, do you mean how do we reach, how are we reaching um, potential students? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay, yes. so um, what we've done, we've start. what we've done um, in the past, well, since it was very local and our study was in L.A., it was a lot of grassroots recruiting. Um, but now, as we're starting to extend into you know, that, you know, that's not really, that's not, that's not going to work anymore. I mean, maybe small grassroots, grassroots recruiting and all over the country. But what we've done is we're working with um, Metro PCS, um, and which is a, which is the biggest unlimited talk text. Um, phone company company in the United States, and which a lot of the, uh, the Hispanic population uses those phones. So we're beginning to work with them, and we're um, to do messaging about our program. We're also starting to go. We've been invited in a lot to a lot of different radio stations. So we're starting to broadcast, um, the, you know, the, and uh, the information about the program and. A couple of um, radio stations have allowed us to do like PSAs, and um, the hardest, one of the biggest difficulties is you know print normal print advertising isn't really effective because yes. you know our our students can't read or have very yes. limited reading abilities. So it's trying to figure out ways, and not only that, but they don't. None of our uh, one of the questions we ask our uh, participants in our study is if they use the internet, um, and none of them, out of seventy people, not one of them has used the internet. So you know another challenge is they it's not they you can't internet messaging wouldn't be really effective either. I mean maybe in the future it will be, but at this point it isn't. So radio, television, and you know working with phone companies. Yeah, that definitely answers my question. <laughs> um, so what I'm really curious about, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so one of my favorite questions on um, that grueling entry form that we have for change makers is the aha moment one or the founding story. So I'm, I'm really curious. Um, so this is for for everyone actually for um, for Zena, Danielle, Unoma, um, and Sara. But what? So when you're when you're looking back, kind of at the entirety of your life, like was social activism something that was um, that was there from the beginning? Like what really pushed you to want to pursue this? Um, because these are important issues. But what what personally? made you decide that this would be your mission? It's a tough one. <laughs> Great question. I really like it. I love hearing aha moments. I can, I can just quickly share my, my personal story. Um, so I, uh, I did Peace Corps in Ghana in West Africa right after college. And um, I received a copy of this book, Where There Is No Doctor, from Peace Corps at the beginning of my service. Um, and I, I didn't know anything about the book or about the organization, but I just immediately fell in love with this book. Um, the philosophy, the accessibility, 
the um, low language level for uh, you know, demystifying health information and making it truly accessible to anyone. Um, so I use this book almost every day in my service there during my work and then any time a, a neighbor or a friend, someone in my village came to visit me with a health question or a problem, it was my go-to resource um, to try to find out what's going on. And then of course for my own health, I looked at it all the time. And I actually um, used this book to diagnose my own appendicitis that I had while I was um, while I was in Peace Corps, and so I, I feel like I owe my life to this book. Um, and then I was lucky enough when I returned home after my service to get a job working with Hesperian Health Guides, the publisher of this book. Um, and I just really feel like from the beginning, um, using the book in my daily life and work um, really just um, transformed my view about health information and how it's so it's considered so privileged, um, especially in this country, that people need to go to school for 10 years before they have the privilege of knowing what's going on in their body. And I feel like um, our book tries to flip that system on its head and just give back the information to people and let them know that it's, it's their right, it's a human right, that they should be knowing about their health and how to improve the health in their lives and their communities. Um, so I think it was using our materials that really inspired me to go into this line of work um, and make healthcare information accessible to those who need it. I guess I'll um, I'll I'll chip in. Um, first of all, I think what you're doing, uh, Zena, is really incredible. You know, I think that. Um, you know, health information is very limited, and and I think it's amazing that you're being you're finding ways to distribute it to people who need that information, need that ac access to that information. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, for us, our kind of aha moment. It was really a collaboration of. Um, a couple who is they're actually they've been funding the research and they initially kind of came up with the idea and myself it was you know was they we've all had the opportunity to travel you know all over the world and what we've noticed and what they've noticed and I've noticed is everywhere we went um, whether it was you know the very rural villages um, or even major metropolitan cities in the slums and slums um, everyone seemed to have either their own cell phone or access to a cell phone but there was not you know there was very limited access to quality information so um, it just kinda clicked why not utilize what they have and what is ubiquitous to distribute quality basic information and we decided to focus on literacy uh, and, per, and in particular, uh, the adult literacy, because we saw that fact that almost a billion adult, adults, well, 796 million adults lack basic literacy skills, two-thirds are women, and, um, and, you know, there's not much being done in that area. When most people, or most governments, and, and you know, there's major initiatives to help ch with children's education and a lot of mobile learning platforms with that focus on children, but adults are kind of, you know, they're kind of forgotten. They, we think, you know, if we educate children, then, you know, that, that, then we'll, that next generation will be, you know, literate and educated, but I think people don't real or sometimes don't realize that um, you know part of what allow or part of what's um, part of adherence for children to be in school and in programs is if their parents see a value in education. So by giving you know their parents even a foundation, even basic education, you know it, it will increase adherence for children. Um, you know there's a lot there's a big ripple effect. So, yeah, that was our aha moment. <laughs> well, 
That's awesome, Danielle. And um, I guess I'll share my own story. I feel kind of honored and privileged to be talking with uh, all of you who are doing fantastic social work. And um, <clears throat> my my story is a little bit uh, short. <laughs> um, I grew up in Nigeria in a family where education was very valued and I saw my parents push uh, the girls and the boys to go and achieve what you wanted to be. And so I, I, I had a huge, um, I grew up having a huge, uh, some passion in me to do something that would value women. Um, especially growing up hearing the stories of my mom being the very first educated woman in her whole village. And uh, so that sort of shaped who I was. I was looking at how to help in some way. Um, and then I, I, my, my background is in engineering, uh, computer and electrical engineering. And in our fourth year, in my, my uh, fourth year in college, uh, we usually have the internship programs that we do. And I was sent off to do an internship program somewhere in the northern part of Nigeria, which is mostly um, Islamic, uh, Islamic religion. And my first shock was that when I went out uh, to do my work, it involved climbing up and setting up a satellite dish and making, getting the home hooked up to a network. Um, five minutes into when I got on site, my manager called me and said that the owner of the place needed me to leave because I was female and that women are not just uh, just not expected to be an engineer, to be climbing, to be doing what other men were doing. So that was a huge shock for me. And then um, fortunately for me, I, I think I, I've been so blessed, I've, I've benefited a lot from, um, from help and scholarships and coming here to get a master's and also to get my doctorate. In my last year of my doctorate, um, I was fortunate to get a, a scholarship that sent us into uh, high schools and middle schools. And the program was to take engineers and scientists and put them in classrooms, sixth grade to eighth grade classrooms. So I, I went into a sixth grade class every week and just to, to show role models and to bring in new ideas and experiences of how technology and science and math is important uh, just from a perspective of a student. And I really enjoyed that experience. But what struck me most was comparing the before and the after of the students that I met. Um, these were low performing schools and a lot of the girls you, I spoke to, I connected with a lot of the girls. Initially when you go in they say, oh I want to be a hairdresser, oh I don't even know why I'm in school, I want to drop out or you know, I want to work at McDonald's. And then by the end of the semester they are starting to have a higher expectations for their lives, starting to realize that they can contribute, that they can do something and they are starting to think about going to college. That changed me, and I believe that was my aha moment. At the end of the semester, we had another survey, and I spoke to a few of the, it was mostly the girls that I connected with. Of course, I wasn't there for the whole classroom. But one girl, her name is Heaven, and she, I will never forget her because that was my aha moment. The, the day she told me that I had made such an impact in her life that she decided she was no longer going to be a hairdresser and she was going to try and go to college. That was my aha moment, and it felt like that's what just making a difference in one person's life means a lot. And for me, that was my aha moment, and that's when uh, that's sort of how Wow Foundation got founded. <clears throat> so that's my story. <laughs> Sarah, would you like to come back? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm really happy to hear all these stories, and, and it's inspiring to share um, all of the personal stories. Now we're getting personal. I'm going to share a bit of Agora's story and my story. I'll do it really quick. Um, Agora, in general, started as a venture fund. Uh, we started just uh, doing loans to small enterprises for them to grow in Nicaragua and a few countries in Central America. 
but then uh, Agora CEO uh, Nicaraguan Ricardo Turan, he found out that they were struggling with the money. They actually didn't know what to do with their money once we gave them the loans. So that's how the accelerator became an accelerator, not only a venture fund. And we started not only um, helping people to get money for their enterprises, but uh, we do consulting and we give the, um, we give them access to not only financial capital, but human and social capital. So it's something uh, more complete, as, as we can say. And then as the accelerator, grew, I started having talks with Ricardo Teran, the CEO in Nicaragua, and I was currently working at an advertising agency for like massive brands like uh, Pepsi or um, Movistar, which is like uh, T-Mobile here in Nicaragua in the, the States, and it was, I, I love marketing, that's what I studied, I love advertising, it's I, I love the insights of huge campaigns and, and, and helping grow a brand, but it's not fulfilling. And meanwhile, I was working at the agency. I started having these talks with Ricardo because they, they needed help for the consultants, um, like a bit supporter of, of, or advice for the consultants uh, for the social enterprises. So I started working um, like an advisor for the consultants and and giving advice to social entrepreneurs and for their brands and, and just as volunteer right not 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 even part-time working just talking to them over the phone and and as I started like getting along with these entrepreneurs I just it just sounded amazing how passionate they were about their businesses and not only about growing their brands and and, and sales but all, but about creating their impact and, and a certain impact and how humanly they spoke about it and not only I mean I was used to talking to the brand manager of Coca-Cola for example and Pepsi and, and these huge brands and then suddenly I I speak to ambitious people but ambitious in a social way it's so different and, and so much fulfilling so then I, I I just started talking to Ricardo and started spending more time at Agora than in my own uh, agency where I worked, not my own agency, the agency, it, it's JWT, I don't know if you've ever heard of JWT. Um, but um, then Ricardo suddenly said, like, you're just too passionate about what you're doing here for us and we are so thankful that we want to offer you a position and I just said yes immediately, like, yeah, this is what I want to do, like, use my ability to help grow social enterprises than these huge brands that at the end won't just do more than increase their own sales. That's basically my story. Wow, wow that's fantastic. We should be talking to you then. <laughs> yeah. You should be applying for the accelerator. <laughs> yeah. But is, is it only open to is it only open to businesses in Latin America? Um, currently we are, but we, 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 I mean, yesterday I was just having a talk with the CEO and we plan to be a global brand and, and we're just doing like a pilot program in, in with Latin America and how it works uh, in Latin America. And, and if this year works, we'll probably like just accept worldwide uh, applications next year. That's awesome. And, but right now we currently have um, 80 applications from Latin America and we're accepting 40 and which 40% are women and not only can afford the program so that's why we're launching tomorrow a, f a fundraising campaign called Accelerate Women Now. I'm about to share the link with you because we, we created a, a, a micro site to, to fundraise and, and we're doing like a, a huge campaign in, 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 in internet. It's LinkedIn, social media, Twitter, Facebook. Um, I, we have a, a video um, with some st uh, women's statistics about entrepreneurship that I can share with you right now, and and we want to fundraise about fifty to sixty thousand dollars to to increase the amount of women entrepreneurs in our program because we definitely see the potential in women, uh, to be honestly more than, <laughs> but. Um, but yes, um, we have some success stories in, in, in the past accelerators on women, uh, women entrepreneurs in Guatemala, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and they're all so passionate about their business and they've grown thanks to us. And, and it's amazing how, how they actually 
take advantage of these programs and, and, and actually get to do a huge change in their communities and their countries. And yes, um, where can I share this? Is there like a, a chat um, window here so I can share these links with you? Okay, I found it. Okay, this is our site for the Accelerate Women Now campaign. And and you're more than welcome to visit it and, and, and to share it in, in in your medias and networks. Okay, let me see if I can I wanna share the video, it's inspiring. I and actually you're the first one to see the videos because we're launching tomorrow, but I'm taking the liberty to to share it with you since you're actually the first group of people about to that will see this video. Which I can't find. <laughs> Here it is. Mm. You know, what, what I actually like about bringing these people together is um, how amazing it is that uh, there are so many great ideas and that we are actually building this um, ecosystem where we can empower uh, girls and women. And then I was just thinking while you were uh, talking, uh, Danielle, uh, how is it that we, we know that information and uh, access to, to a lot of things is important and sometimes we dismiss the first step, which is of course, you know, people must be able to read and then you have to bring them forward um, and, and uh, engage them in other kind of activities and show them that they can be whatever they want to be. Um, and then provide easy access to information and, and in a ways that they can better their health. And, yeah. and, and of course, if they want to be entrepreneurs, um, provide a access uh, to networks and to funds so they can move forward. One thing that we saw in this competition, and uh, I think it, we, we already mentioned it here, but it's, it's how important it is for women to see that they they can do other things and and the, you know the role of um, someone that they can look up to and see that they can have a different uh, lives. So I think this is just amazing and and for me it, it's great to see how each of these innovations they connect into this mm -hmm. ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have just 10 more minutes, uh, uh, so do you have uh, any last um, remarks, comments, um, questions? So I actually have a quick question for maybe you and the Ashoka team. And the question is, uh, so is this a one-time competition? Or are you planning to um, go ahead and uh, is it something that we should expect to see again um, next year? Because we, are, we, we certainly at WOW Foundation are hoping that at, at some point we should uh, be able to apply also. Um, but is it, something that you are, uh, is it something that you are planning to have ongoing? And how do you? What are you looking for in your in your in the winners of the competition? How do you select the winners, and what are you looking for? Okay, so the uh, Change Makers is a, a platform, and we have different competitions um, every year. So they they don't occur in a recurring basis. They are usually one time about the topic. But there are always uh, competitions going on in our website. So um, our idea is to be uh, a central place for people that are working in innovation, social innovation, and all around the world in different topics where they can um, get access to networking, to funding, uh, and to, well, uh, other contacting opportunities like the one that we are having here. So this is uh, in the one hand, but in the other hand, I can tell you that uh, women and uh, technology is a very important topic for Ashoka. So we will certainly have other opportunities uh, on this topic. Yeah, I think it would be lovely for us to 
to expand our site so that we could include um, like more blogs and commentary um, at the very least to keep this conversation going, especially um, like during, well, before, during, and after competitions. Because I think that these themes resonate with people. So we're trying to create, find ways to create communities and create content and knowledge around um, important topics like women and technology. So, yeah. And well, actually, I, oh, go ahead, Danny. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Um, actually, just yesterday, we were having, um, in one of our meetings, we were having a conversation about just how much momentum we've built up after this competition and how, in general, the topic of, of women and women's empowerment is is something that is so, not only important, but it's it's very high profile now, and it's it's almost strategic to to bring this to the forefront now. Um, so we're definitely talking about potential women's campaigns, and would love to keep all of you in the loop um, about what we're you know pushing forth. So yeah, definitely lots of room for collaboration. If anything, we're we're really hoping for it. Yeah, definitely. Also. Awesome. I just want to say that hearing all these stories are like it's so empowering and inspiring. I think um, I know I had chills. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like wow. <laughs> it is inspiring. And it just happens to be that like we're all like women here, which is also very exciting and inspiring. Because yeah. you know, when it's something I'm always nervous about. It's like obviously you need men like men should be allies and whatnot. But I think it kind of is <laughs> hard. Yeah. It is it's so refreshing because I mean in today's world you get sometimes get so overwhelmed by all the negativity and you know pollution and there's just so much bad. You know, it's so refreshing to be with the group of people who are trying to do, you know, really amazing things. It's really inspiring. So thank you for arranging this. This has been a really inspiring morning for me. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Same here. Thank you, Danielle. That that speaks for me as well. Yes, definitely. Danny was the the visionary behind this. So definitely, she deserves a big applause. <laughs> <laughs> I actually say that I I find this this moment it's like you said it's it's inspiring and it's what what actually keeps us moving and um, as change makers too is is to be able to connect with people doing such great things around the world and um, we we also have a lot of challenge to find innovations and and to we're really trying to. To bring as much value to you and as possible, and uh, it's it's not uh, always easy. But when you hear uh, people talking about their stories and the uh, aha moments, that really really keep us keeps us focused and and wanting to go on. Great. So thank you so much for being here. It was a great, great uh, conversation. I hope we can keep in contact. As Marzina said, um, we will definitely uh, have uh, uh, other opportunities and uh, activities in change makers that are connected with women empowerment. Um, and I think that's it. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>